All right, continuing along in our hot topics, we're doing the seven mountain mandate today. And then I've gotten, got some suggestions for some other hot topics. So we got a couple more coming up after this. But if you have some suggestion for a hot topic you want me to uh, talk about, or some topic may not necessarily be a hot topic, but you're like, eh, what does the Bible say about this? Right? Uh, let me know, and I'll be happy to add it on to the list. Um, sometimes, you know, I get a topic, I'm like, well, there's really nothing in the Bible about this, but can we find some general principles that would apply, or, or how would this work out, or, or try to give some perspective on it? So uh, I'm happy to do that. Make sure that uh, if you do have some topic you want me to talk about, uh, get it to me, or you can get it to Stanton, and he'll let me know. All right, seven mountain mandate is pure madness. I would kind of agree with this, definitely, right? Where did it all begin? Seven Mountain Mandate. Where did this idea begin? It's very popular. You hear a lot about, a lot about it now in charismatic, Pentecostal, neo-charismatic circles. So uh, where did this all begin? Was it actually a vision? Did somebody have a vision? Because when you hear some people talk about the beginnings of the Seven Mountain Mandate, they're like, oh, visions, right? Was it actually a mandate? Did God actually say, go out there and do this? Or was it actually a prophecy? Did somebody say, oh, I'm hearing, you know, thus saith the Lord, the Lord God is saying, go out, you know, blah, 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 blah. What, what was it? Where did it come from? And so, you know, one of the things that I do when I get one of these topics is, you know, I, I start researching, okay, what is it? Where, you know, trying to figure out where it's from. And I spend a lot of time trying to backtrack in history. So that's what, you know, that's what my theology degree is. And it's, it's sort of a, it's history of Christianity, Right? And I track a lot of theology. Where did this theology come from? I always love that, that people come up to me and they say things like, well, this is the way the church has been teaching it for 2,000 years. I'm like, no, 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 no. Church hasn't taught anything for 2,000 years, right? They keep changing everything. So, you know, these theologies develop over time. So I, I keep trying to track it back to its original source. It took a while. I'd say it actually took me half a day to finally track back. And I'm going through various uh, uh, books, magazines, academic articles, and it's like, there it is, finally, right? You track it back to its original source, uh, away from all sort of the uh, legends and hype that kind of develop around it, and here it is. This is where it begins. So in his book, Making Jesus Lord by Lauren Cunningham, this is the founder of uh, YWAM, which is Youth with a Mission. Uh, he published this book in 1988. You can find this on page 134. This is what he writes. Sometimes God does something dramatic to get our attention. That's what happened to me in 1975. So the Seven Mountain Mandate did not exist before 1975. So 1975, my family and I were enjoying the peace and quiet of a borrowed cabin in the Colorado Rockies. I was stretched out on a lounge chair in the midday warmth, praying and thinking. I was considering how we Christians, not just the mission I was part of, but all of us, could turn the world around for Jesus. A list came to my mind, categories of society which I believed we should focus on in order to turn nations around to God. I wrote them down and stuck the paper in my pocket. The next day, I met with a dear brother, the leader of Campus Crusade for Christ, Dr. Bill Bright. He shared with me something God had given him, several areas to concentrate on to turn the nations back to God, they were the same areas with different wording here and there. They were written on the page in my pocket. I took it out and showed Bill, and we shook our heads in amazement. Does anybody see any visions happening here? Any thus saith the Lord prophecies? These are two guys, Dr. Bill Bright, Campus Crusade for Christ, right? And Lauren Cunningham, Youth with a Mission. They're missionaries, basically. They're, they're focused on evangel evangelicalism and mission work. And they're like, how do we reach the whole world for Christ? How do we change the world around for Christ? And they began to think about, well, here's different areas that we, should, we could be working in. And they write these things down, and they share them with each other. No special prophecies involved here. No special visions. So when you begin hearing that they had these visions, that they had these, you know, God gave them this prophetic word, that's not what happened. This is what happened. Here's a list refined and clarified a bit over the years that God gave me that sunny day in Chicago. So they kind of combined their two lists. They worked on it. They clarified it. They changed the wording. So this is not the exact thing. So this, didn't, this wasn't handed down, you know, carved into stone like the tablets on Mount Sinai. This was, we thought about this for a while. We worked on this, and here's what it is. Okay, the home, the church, 
schools, government and politics, the media, arts, entertainment, and sports, commerce, science, and technology. And when they talk about the Seven Mountain Mandate today, some of these wordings have changed. So you won't see the church in that, hey, you know, we need to really kind of clean up our own act. You'll see the word religion. We need to clean up everybody else's act, right? You won't just see commerce, science, and technology. It's just business in general. So you'll see different things uh, put there. These seven spheres of influence will help us shape society for Christ. Okay. In a 2007 interview, Cunningham claims his wife Darlene visited Francis Schaefer, that would be Francis Schaefer number four, and that Schaefer had the same list. And you can watch his interview, it was taped, so you can see it there on YouTube if you want, okay, where he talks about this. That Francis Schaefer, who was a theologian, he uh, was the founder of La Abre Fellowship, and he was thinking about the same things. What do we need to do to kind of change the world for Christ? Where, where should we be working? And so he came up with a similar list. So this is an idea, and it's like I always say, oftentimes theologies and various ideas and philosophies kind of coalesce from a lot of different sources beginning to come together, and people begin to kind of play with them and think about them and change them and bring them together. And this is how this happened. This is very normal. This is very natural. This is very organic. This is the way that it happens. And there it sat. And there it sat. From 1975 to 2000, nobody was talking about this. It's like, eh. The idea remained one of Christian involvement in these spheres of influence to promote change from the inside out. So the idea was, as you know, he promoted in his book and he began talking about, and they would talk about these things, we need to get Christians more involved in these areas. Not, we need to capture these. Not, we need to take dominion over these, but we need to just get involved so that there's good Christian influence in all of these areas. And we can actually begin to see this kind of starting to happen in the late 70s, early 80s. Let me see if I can give you some examples. Here's an example for you. How do we take care of the home and family? How do we get involved in shaping the home and family? I think a great example of that is, is Bill Gothard's Basic Youth Conflicts, you know, which eventually became Basic Life Conflicts because all the youth that came back every year got old, right? <laughs> Okay, and you can kind of see, you know, oh, well, we have this whole, you know, Christ, and he gave all this training and seminars and stuff like that. Let's fix all your families, right? Make sure you're all Christ-like families. At some point, I should probably talk, <laughs> do not, talk about Dr. Bill, Goth uh, Bill Gothard, uh, some of the problems that they had there and some of the uh, warped theology that he has. But this was one of those examples. Let's kind of take care of our families. N notice was our families. Let's take care of our families right? Clean up our own, you know, messes at home and bring them into a Christ-like relationship. It wasn't, let me fix your family. It was, let us take care of our families. Uh, education in schools, this was the beginning of the whole homeschooling movement. So you'll see that there was kind of this push at this time to do homeschooling and, uh, Books like Growing Without Schooling became really popular. A lot of theologians began to push this, right? Let's straighten out our education system for our young Christian children so they aren't influenced by all these secular influences. They're not taught all this secular, you know, teaching. And we'll, we'll, we'll just keep them at home and do this. Uh, so this is Frankie Schaefer. Uh, he's number five. And this is actually a good book. I actually like this book. I remember reading this book when it came out. Somewhere buried deep within the garage in a box is a copy of this book. Okay? But he was talking about arts and media, and he was encouraging Christians, you need to get involved in arts and media. Right? You, you need to be involved in this. Uh, and kind of the premise of his book was that Christians have become addicted to mediocre art and mediocre media. Uh, he said, you know, if you look back at the 1980s and you look at Christian art, basically you're looking at a bumper sticker. That's all that it is. You know, that's all we seem to have was bumper stickers and slogans back in the 80s. They're not producing great art like they used to. And they, of course, you know, and he talked about film, filmmaking. Have you guys seen Christian films? Anybody survived all the way to the end of Christian films? Right. There's actually this... Uh, there's this uh, video going around on YouTube. It's a little YouTube challenge. And it's a challenge to, to watch it all the way through the end. And it's a Christian couple, and they're performing at a church, and they're doing Eye of the Tiger.
but the lyrics have been uh, uh, made Christian. Eye of the Tiger with Christian lyrics. And it's like, can you make it to the end of this video? And I made it halfway through, and I'm like, I can't take this anymore. <laughs> and I'm even rooting for these people, right? And I like cheesy stuff. I like the really bad cheesy stuff. I can't tell you how many really bad cheesy movies I've watched. I'm like, I can't make it to the end of this video. So, you know, and I'll agree with him. A lot of Christian media is not very good. But see, he's saying we need to, what he was saying was, Christians, we're being mediocre. We need to do better. But, you know, that's not how people are thinking about it nowadays. We need to take control so they all are forced to watch our terrible stuff, <laughs> right? Instead of, but this is where we're beginning to get things like Trinity Broadcasting Network, the Christian Broadcasting Network, right? We're getting involved in media. And so we can begin seeing that begin to happen. happen. Then the movement begins to get radical. It's not just let's get involved in these areas of influence so that we can give them a Christian influence, Right? It's not, let's just, let's go home, clean up our own things and show people a better way and influence it that way. It's like, let's begin to take things over. And so in the 1980s, there was a political grassroots involvement. This was the time when they started telling people, look, you need to run for a position on your city council. You need to run for a position on the school board. Let's get Christians in there, and we'll take over the school boards, we'll take over the water districts, we'll take over the city councils, we'll take over all these low-level grassroots governments. That way we can begin to impact and control them for Jesus. And so this is why we get a lot of strange stuff coming out of our school boards nowadays, because this campaign was very successful. We have a lot of people who have decided, let's take over the school board, and that way we can decide what's being taught in the public schools. Not let's take our kids out of public school and homeschool them, but let's take over the actual governmental school board there. So this transformed politics more into a voting block, right? Get your church all together, talk to your neighboring churches, hey, we have this Christian guy, he's gonna get on the school board, blah, 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 and they began to organize themselves into voting blocks. So this is the time that we're beginning to get Jerry Falwell and his moral majority, and of course, one of my evil boogeymen that I talk about all the time, Paul uh, Weyrich, he's the individual who realized that, hey, you know, Jerry Falwell was good, and he really organized. He had some good organization there, and he got his moral majority together, but his cause didn't fly outside of the South. For anybody who, who remembers where sort of fundamentalism and, and Falwell's moral majority came from, they were in support of keeping schools segregated. They were in support of segregation. Jerry Falwell down there in the South, in Virginia, said, you know, we're not going to put up with this segregation, so we're going to have segregationist schools. As long as it's a religious institute, the government can't tell us how to run it. And so they were running all-white religious schools so they didn't have to segregate. And the issue came up that the government's like, if you don't integrate your schools, we're not giving you any tax dollars. No more government scholarships for you, right? No more government money for you. And so they went to court, Falwell and Bob Jones, and they helped organize a political grassroots movement. They got together a big voting block and they still lost. But Paul Weyrich, seeing how powerful this voting block was, is let's find a different cause. Segregation doesn't fly outside the South. Let's find something we can get a whole bunch of Christians behind. And they picked abortion. And so they be, Paul Weyrich is the one who chose that particular issue to use that as a wedge issue to create the Christian voting bloc. Uh, Abraham Cooper, Cupper, um, I talked about him a little bit last week. I said a lot of the Seven Mountain Mandate, New Apostolic Reformation, that's on Reformed theology with uh, Reconstructionism and Cooperian um, sphere influence. Abraham Cooper was, uh, Cooper was the um, prime minister, and he was also a theologian. He was the prime minister of the Netherlands. He's Dutch, which also Francis Schaeffer, right? So uh, Abraham, uh, he had this idea, we believe in pillarization. In other words, look, the Roman Catholics do this really well already. They have their, their own church system. They have their own newspapers. They have sort of like their own little government thing going on, all this kind of stuff. They have their own banks, their own businesses. Other groups should be doing the same thing. So if we're Christians, 
then we need to have our own newspapers, our own banks, our own sort of little government, all this kind of stuff. And by having all these various different pillars, we'll uphold society, blah, blah, blah. And so he's like, we need to be separate. We need to create the separate institutions. And so he gave a huge push to keeping everything separate. Get our own newspapers, get our own media. And so a lot of these ideas about spheres of influence come from him. And so most likely this trickled down to people like Bill Bright, Francis Schaeffer, Okay. And, of course, uh, Cunningham. They probably picked up on some of his ideas. Let's see these spheres of influence and let's start building our own stuff. So that's why we have CBN, our own media. This is why we have home schools, our own schools. But this gets radical in that not let's just have our own, let's take over what's out there. This begins to radicalize. Separation to indoctrination to domination. Let's be separate to now that we've indoctrinated everybody to think only this way, you're only allowed to think this way. You're not allowed to think any other way, right? We've kept you homeschooled. We've told you what you need to think. You show great faith by not considering any other evidence whatsoever other than what we told you. Remember, we only told you the truth. To question the truth, you know, then you're failing in your faith. We've indoctrinated you. Now that you've got this indoctrination, go out there and take control. All right, uh, R.J. Rushdoony. Interesting character. He's where we get the Reformed Reconstructionist, which means he's a Calvinist. Follows Calvin's uh, theology. Let's reconstruct society. Society should be reconstructed under the lordship of Christ in all aspects of life. That sounds pretty good. I mean, doesn't that sound like what we want to do? We want to bring forth the kingdom of God on earth so that God's will is done on earth as it is in heaven? I mean, isn't that what we pray? So, I mean, it sounds pretty good, but it's about his methodology that's all wrong. And then, of course, there's this individual, Greg Albonson. I had a huge flashbacks when I pulled up this picture for the first time. Dr. Bonson was one of my high school teachers. You know, like going, why is this eminent theologian, and he is well-regarded within Reformed theology. He is well-regarded amongst the theonomists. I mean, he's like up there. He's like revered as one of their saints. What is he doing teaching high school? How did he end up teaching high school, teaching me in high school at that time? Well, he had been kicked out, fired from the uh, seminary that he was teaching at. And so, you know, to pay the bills, he took whatever job was available, which just happened to be at a high school. So that's how he ended up with us. And, uh, of course, as students who actually knew how to use the library, we found this out and happened to mention it to them. You know, oh, what are you doing here? Because you got fired at that other place? And they're just like, Ugh. that didn't set us off on good things. But anyway, he's kind of like the uh, person behind what's called theonomy, which is that divine laws, particularly the judicial laws of the Old Testament. Now, we should take Old Testament laws. They should be observed by modern society, that we should be living according to Old Testament laws. Ah, we still have flashbacks about him. It was, it was, okay, don't send, you know, a graduate school seminary professor to teach high school. It just doesn't work, all right? It's like total cross purposes. All right, so let's talk about Rush Dooney here. He wrote a, a book called The Institutes of Biblical Law. This is basically the roadmap, the manual for how to establish this uh, uh, theocracy, how to establish theonomy and this huge theocracy and how, how to claim the world for God, okay? Almost all the Old Testament civil law is normative for civil governments and provides a program for establishing a Christian theocracy. We need to bring the Old Testament laws into our governments. So now that we got all these voting blocks going on and we're taking over, you know, school boards, we're taking over water district and all this other kind of stuff, now we got to start taking over congressional seats. Is this beginning to sound familiar? We got to take over these congressional seats. We need to take over Senate seats, right? Right, we got to send up house, state legislatures and all this kind of stuff. And we need to get these people into these positions of power so they can vote for and demand that we put these Old Testament laws on the books. Hmm. Is that scary? That we should follow the Old Testament laws? Let's talk, off, talk about Rush Dooney, a few other things about him. In his book, right, Institutes for Biblical Law, he claims that some people are by nature slaves and that slavery was okay, right? American slavery was very benevolent. 
Of course, he was also a segregationist. He gave a big push to homeschooling so that, you know, white kids wouldn't have to go to school with black kids. We need to homeschool our kids so they don't get mixed up with those black kids. He was a Holocaust denier. Dr. Greg Albonson, he said that only the ceremonial aspects of the law have been abolished. And that sounds really good. But when you kind of begin looking at those 639 laws in the Old Testament, which ones are ceremonial, which ones are not? They kind of pick and choose. Not only that, but this idea behind moral laws and ceremonial laws. If you go to Jewish people, who basically, you know, they're the ones who came up with the Old Testament, they're like, we don't divide the laws that way. So that's like a false category. This means that moral and civil aspects of the law are still binding, that we have to follow these. Somewhere out in my garage is actually a copy of Theonomy and Christian Ethics, the book that he wrote. I'm, survived, I'm surprised it survived because as high school students, we actually bought a couple of copies of the book to see what it was that he was writing. It's about this thick. We did actually burn one at a party one time. <laughs> As a sacrifice. Well, you know, there we go, All right. But I still have a copy of it. Come to find out, it's actually worth money, right? It's hard to get book or something. Uh, these require the death penalty. Get this. This is what they would like to put into our government. These require the death penalty for working on the Sabbath. Homosexuality, adultery, witchcraft, idolatry, blasphemy, and even for incorrigibly disobedient children. See, according to the Old Testament, all of those things are worthy of the death penalty. But this is what he's suggesting that we should do in our government. Is this beginning to sound familiar? Are you beginning to hear some of those voices that echo out there now where we need to, because the Bible says we need to be installing the death penalty for gay people? I hear this from sitting congressmen. But this is where it's coming from. We are one in Christ, we are one in God, we are one in